I love sushi, it's one of my favorite foods, but I truly believe that if you are serving bluefin that you're contributing to the extinction of a species. Well, that's very misleading. I don't feel guilty about eating bluefin. We have inside information. At the heart of our love for sushi is bluefin tuna. The most loved by sushi fans, the most expensive at market, the diamond of the sea. But the global economy has made it more valuable than other. Prices can rise and fall by tens of thousands of dollars a day, and it can lose more value more quickly than any other product on earth. But now, those who care about the fish are starting to worry that our ever-growing appetites may have put it at risk. A generation-long gold rush for this new prize of the seas may be leading to its own extinction. I'm Sasha Eisenberg, a journalist and author of the book, The Sushi Economy, Globalization and the Making of a Modern Delicacy. I started exploring this business about a decade ago, and it's been a tremendous change in the global economy. Today, sushi is a multi-billion dollar international business, and bluefin tuna is the most prized. A single fish can sell for tens of thousands of dollars. I wanted to go back out and see what the sushi world was like now, and what that meant for the fate of the Pacific bluefin tuna. Before the 1960s, Japanese didn't want to eat oily, fatty fish. No one anywhere wanted bluefin tuna. At best, they paid pennies a pound to see it ground up as cat food. But eventually, the Japanese, looking at Americans devouring their bloody red steaks, wanted oily meat of their own and started asking for bluefin tuna at the sushi bar. Japan catches the majority of Pacific bluefin tuna. In fact, Japan consumes 90% of the world's supply of Pacific bluefin tuna, followed by Mexico, the United States, South Korea, and China. And illegal fishing is rampant. Data compiled over the last 60 years on tuna biology and annual catches has led some scientists to conclude that over 96% of the world's original stock of Pacific bluefin tuna are now gone. Some now estimate that fewer than 40,000 adult Pacific bluefin remain in the wild. Concern over the dwindling numbers of Pacific bluefin tuna has long been overshadowed by the attention paid to the Atlantic and Southern bluefin, two other types of tuna already treated as endangered species. Scientific authorities are now concerned about the precarious situation of the Pacific bluefin tuna, whose listing they recently changed from of least concern to vulnerable to extinction. This is a crisis that's affected not only the U.S. and Japan, but, but other players in the sushi business around the world. And I think there's a lot more interest now among people in, in government and industry and media and consumers about the, the need to do something serious about it. Pacific bluefin migrates from the waters around Japan, where its breeding grounds are located, to the Pacific coast off North America. To understand the globalized nature of the sushi business, I'm starting here in Los Angeles. Then we'll follow a tuna back across the Pacific to its other home, Japan. I've come to Hollywood to meet chef Michael Simarusti at his restaurant Providence. Michael's managed to earn two Michelin stars while serving only what he calls sustainable seafood. That means one thing you won't find on his menu here, bluefin tuna. So what does sustainable seafood mean to you? A sustainable fish is one that's been harvested you know, within quota. It's harvested uh, in light of research and science, which says that the biomass is healthy and can support a certain level of, um, of harvest. And is there a bluefin tuna that you consider sustainable? No, absolutely not. I mean, that, that's, I think that's the one fish that um, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that's really thinking about the matter that, that would tell you that um, you know you can feel good about serving it. I serve fish for a living, as do many other chefs. But it's important to me that the fish that we serve are sustainable. So, did you replace bluefin on your menu with something else? Yeah, we use big eye. Uh, we also use yellowfin. So these are other red tunas. These are other red flesh tunas. You know, frankly, I mean, anywhere you would use bluefin, you could also use a big eye or a yellowfin. So what was it that prompted you nine years ago to make the decision to stop selling bluefin? The, the research just coming, kept coming back and it always said exactly the same thing, that it's a species that is in peril, you know, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. Let's say you have 100 friends on Facebook today and then let's imagine that tomorrow you wake up and you're down to four and those other 96 are gone from the picture, never to be seen again. That's what the, exactly where the bluefin is right now. 4% of its historic biomass is what exists in the Pacific today. I truly believe that if you are serving bluefin that you're contributing to the extinction of a species. I mean, I would love to see that there could be a, a sustainable and guilt-free harvest of bluefin at some point, you know what I mean? Bluefin are international fish. So bluefin, they span the globe. It's very difficult to legislate the harvest of a fish that travels the way bluefin do. There's so many 
species in this world, obviously, that are threatened. But I feel like it's difficult, I think, to form a connection with a fish. That's the problem. That is the real problem. People don't care enough. People are so passionate about so many other things, but when it comes to something like, you know, saving the giant bluefin, it's difficult to raise people's ire in light of all of the science, in light of everything that's been said, in light of all the information that's out there. And it's such a simple thing to say. None of us in the United States are going to starve because we don't eat bluefin on a daily or weekly basis. No one. The question is, how do you develop passion, enough passion in people to just sit down at a sushi bar and say a few simple words, which is, I don't eat bluefin, you know? You can take bluefin tuna off your menu if you're an American or a French restaurant. What happens if you're a sushi bar? I'm gonna go to one of the hundreds here in LA, talk to a chef about what his choices are. Across town at Hamasaku, one of hundreds of sushi bars in the greater LA area, there's rarely talk about the environmental consequences of loving bluefin. But the chef has his own sort of interesting story. He's from Japan, but he's worked in Jamaica making sushi, and so uh, he's very much interested in sort of interpreting sushi for the time and place in which he's serving it. So how long have you been a sushi chef? I'm almost doing 14 years now. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, why don't you yeah, yeah, serve well, me what's good today? Yeah, actually, I have bluefin tuna. Otoro, Otoro is going to be a fatty portion right. from Spain. OK. Yo, it's right here. Is that a very fatty piece? Yeah, that's ranch? this is kind of bottom side, like a baby bottom side. And was it wild or ranched? Do you know? Actually, this is ranch. Ranch, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ranching and farming were both developed as a way to take some of the pressure off of wild stocks. There are various methods of harvesting Pacific bluefin tuna, and each of them comes with their own trade offs in terms of sustainability. When you ranch, you're taking small fish, which means that they are removed from the water before they can reproduce, moving them through nets into pens where they can be fattened in captivity. But in doing so, you're obliterating the juvenile stocks that otherwise would grow large and breed themselves. Farming takes the whole life cycle and does it in captivity. Alleviates all of the pressure off of wild stocks and doesn't touch juveniles. But growing an adult bluefin tuna from birth and captivity is an incredibly expensive enterprise. Bluefin tuna metabolize 15 times their body weight, which means that for every pound of tuna that you grow out in captivity, you're having to put 15 pounds of wild feed. That means mackerel, pilchard, squid in the pen for it. There's obviously not any easy solution to bringing this rare predator to our plates. It's difficult to get, you know, like a wild fish. Best way is a wild cut. Yeah. But, you know, they don't have any kind of crazy fat. That's why bluefin tuna, I recommend uh, farmer's bluefin. But I used to be Japanese, that's much easier. Uh, bluefin tuna. It was too fatty, right? Yeah, too fatty, you know, too meaty, I mean. And do you find customers that are concerned about ordering bluefin now because of the environment? Actually, long time history. Still people do like it, people do order it. What do you say to customers who tell you that they have a problem with I bluefin? I mean, just you don't need to eat. I mean, you don't want to eat, don't, don't eat that thing, you know? That's right way. I don't want to push in customer to have to eat. They fight with you about that, or? The... Some customer, they like fight, that's yeah. right. But I, I never say fight to them, you know? It's exactly. You don't want to eat, just don't want to eat. Well, kanpai. Kanpai. When you sit down at a sushi bar and you order a piece of fish, all you're doing is interacting with the chef. But there's this whole world behind them. It's passing through six, eight, ten different hands across continents. Money's moving, values changing, expectations are changing. And so I wanted to go explore what, what's happening behind the sushi bar. How is that fish coming to me? And what does it mean for the world? A big part of eating sustainable seafood is knowing where it comes from. So I'm going to a fish distributor to find out for myself. Rex Ito is a marine biologist who 25 years ago got into the business of dealing tuna and he runs Primetime Seafood, a distributorship right next to LAX Airport in Los Angeles. So the major ports of entry in the U.S. for fresh fish in general is LA, Miami, New York and then kind of, kind of distributes from there. And so the fish we see today will come in to LAX on a plane and then you will just picked it up and... Yeah. There's a joke that the biggest fishing harbor now is an international airport because the, the fish are no longer coming in just by boat but by air. We still have this romantic idea that when you want the freshest fish, you go find the place that's closest to the water. But it's probably actually in unsexy places like Rexito's warehouse that are the closest to the place where the fish are landing in the United States. So pick it up the airport, we grade the fish, we take samples of the fish, and depending on the quality of the fish, we'll determine the price and the market it's going to go to, and we'll and we send out throughout the country to different customers. Tuna is a very special fish. It's one of the few fish that's warm-blooded. So what that means is the internal temperature of the tuna is about 
is 10 degrees centigrade higher than the ambient water temperature. So that, that's why that fish can be in cold water and have bursts of speed and keeps them metabolically active, right? And how fast do they swim? I think 50 miles an hour. Okay. They can get up to 50 miles an hour. It's, it's an incredible, where, it's a beautiful animal. Where does the strength come from in a, in a fish like that to go 50 miles an hour? Well, the whole body is muscle. You can tell the shape of the fish is like a torpedo. It's, a, it's really a, a magnificent fish. So this is an example of a, okay, of a burnt right. fish, which means the, the, the meat got heated up. It's not that sweet taste. Taste that. And then, and then taste that. Well, definitely more acidic. Yeah. That's exactly what a sushi chef can taste. These are farm bluefin from Mexico. Okay. So when you say farmed, what does that uh, mean? More accurately, it's ranched. Okay. Right. Farm would be from egg to harvest. These fish are caught wild, kept in. Now how how large are they when they're caught wild? It depends. They can be anywhere from. 15 kilos up to 100 kilos. So there is oil and fat in all parts of this fish. Chefs are looking for is this belly section, the old toro. And how much more would a piece of that sell for at a sushi bar than that? Several times? Maybe as much as triple. Okay. So as a marine biologist, what are you afraid of in the long term about, about tuna? If we follow science and maybe not politics, we could easily manage uh, the tuna fisheries in the world. They mean setting regulations and enforcing them? Yeah, correct. So the latest, you know, the sky is falling kind of information is that 90% of the Pacific, the blue in the Pacific are gone, or they can't, they can't seem to find them. Well, that's very misleading, but curiously, the, the biomass and the production and capture of bluefin has remained in the Pacific, has remained constant for 50 years. So that's why you know, I have an issue with between science and politics. I think you can take any, any data and construe it any way that you want to, that you want to, 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 to the cause that you're, that you're purporting. But I think what I'm saying now, I let the studies happen. I don't have a problem with that. I think we do need to conserve. And I don't feel guilty about eating bluefin in a, in a, ordering bluefin in a restaurant. Because I mean, but we have inside information maybe. You know? It's very difficult to say we're sustainable. Does that word mean anything to you? I think nothing is truly sustainable, okay. right? I think, I think it, uh, my best description of me is it's caught in a responsible way. And that affects the types of fish that are available to people in the U.S.? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, as an importer to the U.S., one of the first things we check is what's the price in Japan? What's going on in Japan? If the prices are low in Japan, we're going to get higher quality fish from the Asian suppliers. It's clear from talking to him that what really drives the market around the world is what takes place in Japan. Just as Pacific bluefin migrate from the California coast to the waters off Japan, I'm following their trail to find out what I can learn on the other side of the ocean. I'm heading to the largest fish market in the world and the epicenter of the global seafood industry. We're here at Skiji Market in downtown Tokyo. This is known as Tokyo's Pantry because it's where many of the capital's restaurants and markets get their ingredients. It's also one of the largest and most dynamic seafood markets in the world. We're here to take a look at the tuna auctions, where expectations and prices for bluefin are set that affect everything across the world. Every day, fish are coming in from all over the world, and, and the number or quality of them varies dramatically. Lay them out in big, cold warehouse, and starting before dawn every morning, some of the hundreds of seafood dealers who are based in the, the Skiji market come and begin inspecting fish and deciding which ones they want to bid on. The big auction houses that sell tuna at the Skiji market are known generically as the Suisans, the seafood companies. And their buyers at the auctions are known as Naka Oroshis, means intermediate wholesalers. So how does that work, that the prices here are able to affect prices at, around Japan and other parts of the world? Mm. How much of the business is, is tuna, is maguro? 
And what are the advantages for the fish to physically move through the market? So how many tuna did your company sell today? の、マグロで in 2012, at the prestigious New Year's auction at Skiji, a single tuna sold for $1.76 million. Even last year, a bluefin went for $70,000. While these prices don't reflect the fair market value of a tuna, they do reflect the cultural prominence of tuna in Japanese life. This is big business. This is the center of a massive global marketplace, the same way that the New York Stock Exchange is. The difference, though, the tuna industry hasn't been changed by the development of new financial instruments. Not just anybody can bid on a tuna at the Skiji market. One of the dealers who's based there needs a license, and it's a little blue chip that they usually put on their hat or on their shirt. And they come in and they start inspecting the fish. Often it's less than an hour to go through hundreds of fish. And so there's this really rapid process of sizing up a fish, looking at its shape, uh, looking at the skin to get a sense of its firmness, its texture. The tail section will be cut off, so you get a look at a, the, to get a sense of the oil content. You can see how the fat's marbled there. You can see how evenly the fat's distributed through different parts of the fish, through each of its lobes. Auction houses will, will number their fish with, with red paint on its belly. This is basically a barcode for the auctions. Fish don't have names. All they have is a yellow piece of paper on them that'll say the, the port or the country at which it was landed, whether it was farmed, ranched, wild. Everything beyond that, Assessing its value is up to individual buyers before they bid on it. As soon as the bell rings to start the auctions, to go figure out which of the different uh, fish they want to bid on. And from then on, it's a Japanese market slang calling out numbers. <laughs> An incredibly complicated set of hand signals. <laughs> Do you see a change in the demand internationally, in the United States or other countries that are competing for the same uh, supply of fish? As soon as the auction on individual tuna is concluded, the auction house that sold it will mark the buyer and it's up to them to cart it off back to their stall through the sort of maze of the market. And often quickly with the tuna, they want to get it cut up to see what's inside. I mean, they're seeing all the different cuts of tuna, which they will price differently because an individual sushi bars are gonna go through more than 20 or 30 pounds of it in a day. These are the people that stand between a, a restaurant and a small market and the, the big seafood importers. あ、ありがとうございます。マグロ how much does it matter that uh, Maguro has such an important place in Japanese culture? うん、やっぱり日本っていうのは海に囲まれてる国で、あの、世界中でも魚を食べる量っていうのはものすごく多い国だと思うんですよね。だからそういう面で非常に魚重要な蛋白源になってると思うんですよね。昔はね、あの、
the amount of fish are declining. まあ、一番大きいのは小さい魚の取り過ぎね。で、だから産卵、産卵する年齢になる前に取っちゃう量がものすごく多いですね。えっと、本マグロの場合はもう90% 以上、97% and how much do your customers know or want to know or care about where the fish came from or how it was caught。なかなかあの、普通の人がどういう形で魚が取られてるかっていうのはなかなかわからないでしょ。一般の方は本当にお寿司で食べたって一切れか二切れでしょ。そうするとそこまで考えてるかどうかっていうと難しいところだね
adult fish. And how did we get here? Can you sort of explain? Our way to catch uh, the bluefin tuna is not so good because we are catching too much small fish, child fish. So we have to restrict that part so that that small fish can be the adult. That's the main uh, purpose of the rebuilding plan now. I had lunch at Sushi Dai in Tsukiji Market and they had Meiji. <laughs> No, no, no. How will you convince a sushi chef who takes so much pride in, in his maguro? But you see, uh, in the meeting, Tsukiji, they understand that uh, this is uh, their, their business. It's bad behavior. And uh, spawning ground uh, located only in Japan, Japanese water. So you see, you have a responsibility to protect that fish. But you see, that fish migrate in a very wide range. At that age of the just one year old, they go across the Pacific and go to California and Mexico. And Mexico is catching a lot of the young fish too. And Korea is also another uh, big actor, but you see, we have to work with those countries so that conservation will be ensured for that species. What has changed in the sort of domestic politics in Japan to make uh, the government more receptive to this than they were before? We, we learned a lot from that uh, painful process of Atlantic proof in tuna. We worked with the European Union, but you see, uh, we are too late. You see, too late to take the uh, uh, meaningful action. Now Japan is a major market. We have to uh, take our responsibility as a market. The management plan. What are the new rules, guidelines that are that have been set? First, it's objective. Objective is we build the adult fish uh, to the average level uh, within ten years, and uh, uh, to attain that objective we have to reduce the small fish catch as much as possible. So we decided at the, at the first stage, 50% of reduction of the small fish catch. And uh, I hope that other countries will accept that, then we can work together. The United States is uh, taking some distance from the, what we are doing. Because you see, they, they are a little bit concerned about their sport fish. Man. But you see, we cannot wait for the United States. That's why we, we decided, to, decided to go ahead. My announcement of not to eat small fish Last year, so many complaints from the consumer. Why are you are saying government officials are saying no, not to eat something? I'm not saying, you see, blue, bluefin should not be eaten. You see, bluefin will be eaten forever by reducing the you see, catch of small fish now. From the perspective of conservation of, of bluefin, what, what has innovations in ranching and farming meant? Yes, our farming industry is producing nearly 10,000 metric ton of bluefin too. But the majority of the fish, is originated for the natural fish. So they are using small fish. So we have to uh, reduce that kind of impact uh, by introducing artificial hatchery. And how successful has it been? As Technically, it's successful. And what are the challenges? But uh, economically, not yet. We've heard a policymaker not only acknowledge overfishing of bluefin, but say it's an urgent concern about which Japan needs to be a leader on the world stage. For once, the Japanese are talking about their national interest being not only in catching bluefin, but in conserving them. To better understand the challenges of bringing farm bluefin tuna to market, I've come to Kinki University's laboratory in the open waters off Kushimoto. Kinki University is an institution with large fisheries labs that have played an outsized role in Japanese aquaculture. Its biggest breakthrough, developed over 40 years, was learning how to breed bluefin tuna entirely in captivity. Those fish are now sold as kindai tuna. And so you've branded these fish. Kindai maguro というのは近畿大学の水産研究所で卵を取って人工的に育ててきたマグロを食用サイズにして出荷する日本で商標登録をしております。And so when we say that Kinki was the first to complete the life cycle for bluefin tuna. What does that mean? 人工的な飼育環境で養殖を継続できるということが可能になります。ということは自然界にいる魚を使わずに養殖ができるということですから、資源が減っている魚を減らすことなく魚を確保できるとになると思います。So this is where Kindai Maguro are. Yeah, it is. So what happens in this pen?、Uh, we have 25 tails of this pen. And this is a fish to get eggs from to the production. How do fish they get in here?、Uh, we originally hatched from eggs, and we transport from land-based tank to the net pen. Okay. And we feed them to bigger and bigger, 
to grow up. When the fish are growing, how large do you get them before they're ready to harvest? Uh, normally we harvest three years. Okay. Two to three years. And how, how large is that then? Uh, the average is 40 to 50 kilograms. Okay, and how long is a fish like that? Uh, 1.5 meters. And how much of the feed is natural and how much of it is chemicals or...? or... No, we don't use chemicals. Okay. Everything is from nature. We feed this fish today, squid. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so how much would a, a bluefin eat one of these a day? Uh, normally we feed one to two percent of body weight. Per day? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. So are they eating? Can you see? What's going on? So sometimes we do different from the normal. They act something different. So they don't eat squid now. So you want to keep it calm as though they're out in, in nature? I can say tuna is more sensitive than the other fish. To the conditions? The conditions. Yeah. There we go. Is there a different taste or texture of the meat depending on what it eats? Now we try to compare it grow out by artificial diet and uh, live bait. Taste, cost, everything. And have you seen any differences in... So in... far, not, not yeah. so okay. large differences. Why did it take so much longer to successfully breed bluefin tuna? First of all,魚を捕まえて池取りにして網の中で養殖するのが非常に苦労した点です。研究を始めてから9年後に池その中で初めて卵を取りました。これが世界で初めての記録になりました。この育てるためにはやはり餌となるものを天然のものから調達せざるを得
But plastic proofing tuna, 80% of the catch was from Japan. Japan should take the lead. Otherwise, it's us Japanese ourselves. We lose our food culture. Japanese government lose their faith both from international society and from Japanese consumers. How does Greenpeace see uh, bluefin farming? At this moment, we shouldn't, consumers shouldn't think, or like market players shouldn't think this as the solution of the Pacific bluefin tuna issue. One of the biggest concerns is that to make one meat of tuna, they need about 22 kilograms of um, small fish. Um, for the tuna food. If we talk about the whole ecosystem in the ocean, it's not a solution at all. It's pretty clear that people all across the market accept the underlying scientific reality that overfishing is a problem, and that to preserve their future livelihoods, we're all gonna have to do something about it. Unlike when I first started exploring the sushi trade a decade ago, I see a much greater willingness among people all around the world to acknowledge that overfishing has its consequences, and especially that our love for bluefin has an environmental cost. But no one country is going to do this on its own. You're not going to see a single government crack down on its own businesses. And as long as there's a big ocean with fish moving through it, this is going to be a problem that needs more than one country to handle. Chefs may feel that they can do their part by taking bluefin off their menus, and consumers may feel that they can do more by ordering more intelligently. But are we really going to expect people to put down their chopsticks and stop eating bluefin tuna for good? I doubt it. Politics, economics, diplomacy, all of a part to play here but they're up against a far more persistent driver of human behavior, taste.